Okay, just a minute, everybody, as we get connected to the technology in the schoolhouse. Hi, Laura. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Architectural and Site Control Commission meeting of Portola Valley of October 10th, 2022. Uh, Laura, would you call the roll? We're getting use of the new technology in the schoolhouse, so let me know if there's any problems um, as we're working this through. Um, Chair Ross. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Coke. Here. Commissioner Chung. Here, noting that I will be recused from this. And Commissioner Sill is expected this evening, um, and Commissioner Wilson is not expected. All right. So we'll wait for Al before we start item number one. Uh, but in the meantime, we can op up, open up oral communications. So if there's anybody attending out there, via Zoom that would like to make a comment to us on an, uh, any subject that is not included on our agenda tonight, uh, this would be the time to raise your hand and speak up. We have MJ Lee. Good. MJ, you're up. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, sorry. I I, uh, all right. First of all, uh, I want to thank the ASCC for your work. I, I know your volunteerism is solely based on your desire to help the town and preserve the qualities that make our community unique and desirable. I have no intention to criticize what you do, but I am here to make two suggestions. I attended the September 28th town council meeting in support of Irene and Pedro Ruiz and in their appeal of the plans for uh, 1195 Westridge. While I understand and accept all the decisions made, it seemed the appellants did not have sufficient notice to voice their concerns during you know, the entire uh, permit process. And thus, they were too late um, you know, to affect uh, the changes that they would have liked. So my suggestions are, could the town create an automatic notification list so that people who subscribe are notified of changes to an app application. For example, I attended an ASCC site review of a neighbor across the street from me. That house was to be a remodel, but when they started construction, it turned out to be a complete demolition. I'm sure the demolition was for a good reason, but I was just surprised that plans had changed so much without anyone notifying me. Secondly, I suggest that notice be increased to 1,000 feet. People are affected by basements further away than 300 feet. And I give three examples. I received no notice on the uh, 1195 Westridge property because my house is 715 feet away, but I would have liked to weigh in on the massive basement that was proposed. Secondly, some years ago, a neighbor two houses at 350 feet, of, 350 feet, three feet above me installed a large basement. They drain their basement water onto a hillside that empties into my yard. The first winter, the amount of water coming down the hill doubled and my crawl space was flooded. 
Another, uh, lastly, another neighbor on Meadowood told me that after a new home 660 60 feet from her installed a basement, that water or the water that she used to collect is now pumped into, into the street by that basement. So, so I just wanted to bring this up based on um, what I heard at that town meeting. Thank you. Thank you, MJ. Um, we don't. Uh, actually, we're not even permitted to uh, discuss or debate this issue, but uh, staff may have some comments about why the procedures are set up the way they are. Um, if not, uh, I, I think uh, they've certainly entertained having some correspondence with you on that subject. Um, Laura, do you have any, any comments? Yeah, I'd be happy to make a couple comments. Um, MJ, related to the specific project questions that you expressed, if you want to send me an email, I can look into some of the specific um, project questions. In relationship to the process itself, this appeal did raise some questions from planning commissioners and from members of the council that they wanted us to start looking at. So I anticipate that we'll, um, we'll probably start with the chairs of both the ASCC and the planning commission meeting with the mayor. And then we'll decide if it's warranted to have some kind of study session or additional discussion about some of the things that were learned through that process. So I do anticipate additional conversation coming up on this in the coming months. Thank you, Laura. Let's see, do we have Al with us yet? Yeah, Al's here. Oh, very good. Hi, Al. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm having some weird computer problems today. All right, great. Oh. All right. All right, now that we have a quorum, we'll uh, move on to new business. We have one item, uh, and I understand that uh, Commissioner Chung will be recusing himself from the review since he is also the applicant. Uh, this item is an architectural review of an application for a deviation from the town's geologic land use policies and a variance to allow a proposed addition to an existing residence and a new carport slash garage structure to be located within required setbacks. The address is 339 Wayside Road, and this is the Ralston Chung uh, residence. And uh, is Susan with us, or are you going to be making it? Um, I'm going to be making the presentation on behalf of Suzanne. Um, so as the chair just mentioned, um, this is an architectural review that the ASCC is reviewing tonight. This is a project that goes up to Planning Commission. So this is set up to be a recommendation from ASCC to Planning Commission. They're the decision-making body because of the deviation and because of the variance. Uh, we're joined this evening by John Wallace, who's the town geologist, who's been involved in this project um, since, it, since it began because of the complexity of the soils in this area. And so he'll be available to answer questions and to add on a little bit at the conclusion of my staff report. Oh, really? I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt, but could you just clarify what you mean by when it began? Are you talking about the previous review and approval of this uh, on this site? Has he been involved that long? Um, the team from Cotton Shires and Associates would have been involved in the previous deviation that was approved. John Wallace has been involved in this version um, since the applicant's team, team started working on it um, a year and a half ago or so. Thank you. And again, we're working through the new technology, so forgive any little flubs here as we go through. <laughs> So this is at 339 Wayside Road, and here's a rendering on the front slide, um, really helps the 3D renderings help in this case to visualize the project um, in its context. So the proposed project is in addition to the house, 541 square feet, new garage and carport with a total of 410 square feet, an accessory space in the lower level of 262 square feet, New decking that wraps around between the new buildings and creates um, a connection and open space. There's uh, importantly a new driveway approach. And so this site currently doesn't have any off street parking. And so this driveway would connect that new garage and carport out to the street 
and create a safe access point. They're just very, very minor grading associated with the project and there's no protected trees proposed to be removed. So in terms of background, the chair just alluded to this a little bit. There was a previous project that was quite similar in nature that was approved by the Planning Commission in 2002. There's not very many deviations that are approved in town. So each one of these um, includes a lot of analysis and thought that goes into it. So the findings and the things were made to be able to approve that back in 2002. So one of the things that we were looking at is what has changed in regards to this project since that time. And then looking at the architecture um, and, and how it's laid out, that's really what we're looking at this time. So there is an addition under the garage and the carport is not included. So I'm sorry, the addition under the garage and the carport were not included in the prior project. And this is the deviation from the geologic map and the land use policies. And then there's a variance that's required to allow the addition and the garage and carport because the entire structure is within the setbacks. And we'll show you that um, with the detailed drawings. So here's the vicinity map. You're all familiar with Wayside Road. This is along the section um, that's quite narrow past the subject site. It's in the RE1A zoning district. The parcel is 0.26 acres and the slope, there's quite a bit of average slope at 23.3%. So this um, is a house that's right along the existing road with the slope um, down behind it. And the topographic survey is included in the packet. Um, you can see the way that Wayside Road curves around here. This is a driveway to um, a neighboring property. And then this is the small existing house and then the wood deck that wraps around and then the tree um, that's kind of a visual marker when you're looking at this. And then you can see it gets pretty slope, steep sloping down um, behind here when those topographic lines are close together. Here's another visualization of the site plan. So the existing house is here in white. This is in addition in green to the main house. This is the new decking area that wraps around that existing tree and then more access here. And then this is the driveway. And then this is the new garage and carport structure with the living space below it. This also shows you the shape of the full um, area of the property. And these lines are the standard setbacks. So this shows you that for a house to be located in this location, it would have to be set all the way back here on the very steep portion of the site. So it's not feasible um, to do construction back here. So staff does think that the various var variance findings are appropriate in this case to be able to make better use of the existing house that's located up close to the street. And then here are the floor plans. Um, I'm sure the ASCC was able to visualize them um, in three dimensions, um, but if there's any members of the public, just to give you a sense of how this works, um, this is the main level floor plan uh, for the house. And then the addition includes this living space below it and this new staircase that connects. And then here's the deck again. And then on the lower level is this accessory space. And then at the street level, there's a carport located here, and then there's an enclosed garage here. We understand from the um, applicant team that they are a bicycling family. And so they wanted to have an area for the car and then an area to enclose their bikes as well in the garage. So for project data, this is a very limited property. It has very limited development potential and very strict floor area requirements. And so they are trying to make the house more livable um, and stay within those requirements. The vertical height increases, but is still well below the maximum. Same thing with the maximum height. Um, the front setbacks, I'm sorry, here are not updated, but they are correct. The setbacks are um, correct in your staff report. And then going through the sections, this helps everyone to visualize how the new areas are and how they're located together, how it fits into the hill. Here's the west the elevations. You can see the garage and the carport and then the front of the house that faces right to the street. 
And then moving around um, to the east elevations, again, capturing the two levels and how each of the buildings fit into the site with the tree, um, a focal point in the middle. And then north and south elevations. And then the roof plan, you can just say, it's, see it's very simple roof forms um, that are consistent with the simple style of, of the home and fitting into the architectural style and with the neighborhood. The exterior colors and materials, the applicant team would like to preserve some options as they go into construction and design, knowing that costs are very high and it's hard to get some types of materials right now at a reasonable time frame. And so what they've submitted are all natural colors um, to blend into the site and fire safe selected materials. They want to be able to have a couple of options um, in terms of the roof and want to make sure that they um, maintain some flexibility. So the ASCC may wish to clarify, you know, if there's any other choices that they may want to consider, but they would all be within this general palette and also fire safe. Here's the lighting plan. Um, there are just uh, five, yeah, total fixtures. They are all uh, downlit. There's two different styles. They all comply with the regulations and it's just enough lights to be able to have um, the lights at the entrance points as required by the building code. Here's the 3D models again that show you how it fits into the hill and you can understand the relationship here to the street. We sent the customary notice to neighbors within 300 feet of the site. We received um, letters in support of the project. And then earlier today, we received four more comment letters and those have been distributed to the ASCC. They were all comments in support of the project. So our staff conclusion and recommendation from our planning staff, um, we do find that the project conforms to the aspects of the zoning code that apply. So other than the setback requirements that are the subject of the variance, we find that it conforms to the design guidelines. It's exempt from CEQA. And we have prepared findings for approval um, for the ASCC to consider in your recommendation to planning commission. We also included the findings for your information in the packet as attachments for the variance and for the deviation. Those um, items rest with the Planning Commission, but we wanted you to be aware of what our analysis was on those. So we do recommend, staff recommends that the ASCC recommend approval of the project. We'd be very happy to hear your comments or any suggestions. And of course, if you have recommendations on conditions of approval, we'd be happy to hear those as well. The project team um, is listed here. And so we'll have um, in just a moment, hopefully a presentation from the applicant. And we have the findings here if the ASCC wishes to discuss them, um, but they are outlined in the staff report. So with that, um, that concludes our staff presentation from the planning staff. And then I'd like to turn it over to John Wallace for him to share um, his observations um, on this project. Thank you, Wallace. Welcome, John. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> uh, again, I'm. Uh, John Wallace with Cotton Shires and Associates, town geologist. And um, I have been involved um, peripherally since 2001 when this application came in. Ted Sayre and I from our office uh, reviewed it. And so I do have background on that if, if anyone has questions on the prior application. Um, we reviewed the <clears throat> current uh, application starting, I think a year and a half ago, uh, when it initially came in for a map modification. Um, and, and then we carried it through once the map modification was, was not pursued any further, um, the applicant switched to the deviation slash uh, variance. Um, and so, if you want, Laura, I can show you just a quick background of what we looked at from a geologic perspective. Um, and I'll, sh is the screen sharing on? Um, yes, you should have screen share capabilities and 
through the chair. Um, that's what I was thinking. John could give some of the highlights of the geologic um, investigation and his analysis. That would be great. Thank you. Let me, what, what's up on the screen right now? Your PowerPoint is showing, but it's not in presentation mode. So we just see okay. the slides on the left. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll just start with the, um, the town movement potential map. And you can see I uh, pointed to the site. Um, I know for those that aren't familiar with this, it's a lot of shapes and colors. Um, the primary thing to, to understand here is the orange is what we call a PD zone. So it's a potentially deep landslide zone. And that has very restrictive um, building uh, categories associated with it. You'll also notice the bright red is the moving deep landslide. And the one thing that Laura brought up was the, the setback envelope and how far down slope it was. And I don't know if you can see the cursor. Uh, I'm kind of circling the property where the blue dot, blue and white dot is. You'll notice that the, the red, which demarks the active landslide is basically going right through the, the building envelope that Laura laid out that's based on the strict setbacks. So that's one of the reasons for geologically that we, we obviously prefer <laughs> uh, any building to be outside of the active zone. The potentially deep zone is not currently moving, but has the potential to move. And <clears throat> this red active zone is, is active and there, um, the geologic uh, investigation that was performed by Michalucci and Associates identified moving ground down there. So we definitely um, did not want to see any, any building down within the lower part of the property. Uh, this is a, a shot of the town geologic map. Again, it's, it's very complicated to look at in this format. Um, anything in red um, is a landslide zone. And so it's, it falls uh, within a mapped you know, deep landslide zone. The, anything in blue is relatively stable bedrock sites. And so there really aren't any of those close by. Uh, the one thing that um, back in the 2000s, when, when this first came through, um, there have been new methods for investigating hillside areas. And um, back then we used aerial photographs that were um, typically taken by um, aircraft and you put these in uh, stereoscope and you would make your best effort as far as mapping the terrain. Um, we've since gotten a much better technique. It's called LIDAR. And this is the area you can see the site. Uh, the blue dot is the property. And this is an imaging phenomenon much like um, undersea sonar, but it's, it's uh, terrestrial and it's, it has, a, it strips vegetation. And so you're, <clears throat> it enables us as geologists to, to see the true topography. And when you compare a traditional air photograph versus the new LIDAR data, it's striking. And it's a technique that has enabled geologists to, to be much more accurate in their mapping and to be able to um, more accurately portray the, the geologic conditions um, on, in a map view. And so we, um, we actually, as uh, the town geologists, have compiled the entire town now with a compilation map of LIDAR. And Laura, I wanted to let you know that we've got this available for the town. It's, we've just finished it. So um, I'd like to talk to you about that. But we also make this available to consultants that, that haven't downloaded this. It's publicly available data, but it does take some, some uh, computer skills uh, and, it, and some GIS um, skills to be able to compile it. 
Um, so we make this available, especially on difficult, complicated geologic sites such as this. Um, and it, it really helps um, the project geologist and us kind of look at things on a level playing field. And, and, and in this case, you can make inferences for you know, the geologic conditions. You can do line work, um, for example, and take these bare earth images and turn them into geomorphic maps. In this case, there's, there's very obviously very complicated and deep landslides in the area. Um, uh, And I'll, I'll basically just cut to the, the conclusion that we came to in our, in our report. Um, I believe it was November of 2021. Um, I think that was our last report. Um, the, the primary issues that we were looking at were um, the very narrow nature of the road um, is, is basically a public safety issue. Um, not only that, but it's crossing landslide terrain. And <clears throat> so the, the, the issues that we looked at in 2001 were very similar to what we looked at um, in the recent application. And number one, the, the importance of this access road and the, the applicant in their proposal um, proposed a, a deep peer supported foundation for the carport or garage structure. And that has the ability to stabilize the road. And in these areas, um, and I know Wayside Road um, has several areas where the road actually was compromised back in the, in the late eighties. And um, there were some peer supported uh, areas that were necessary. So losing this road is, is obviously a huge issue and nobody wants that to happen. So the, the fact that they can come in with a, with a structure that is non-habitable, meaning uh, the other thing we don't like to see on large landslides is, is any addition to septic uh, contribution, any addition to groundwater from landscaping or septic. Um, and oftentimes applicants argue that it's, it's a minimal influence. However, when you, when you continue to add uh, the cumulative effects of, of minor, supposedly minor additions to an entire landslide, you can get it moving. And there's classic case histories um, to demonstrate that. So that's something our office is very, very concerned about. And we don't like to see the incremental addition of, of uh, landscaping or septic contributions on a, on a slide area because it, it affects everybody. And it's not just the, the applicant that says, well, I'll waive, you know, I'll waive my uh, rights or whatever to, you know, live on a landslide terrain and I'll sign a waiver. Well, it, it, that doesn't help everybody else. So we, we really look closely at that. Um, so in this case, there's no contribution uh, to the septic. It's a very minimal um, landscape endeavor. Uh, the peer supports um, are a very positive influence on the stability of the road. And re just remember that the, the active part of this hillside is, is moving down slope of the road. And so we certainly don't want that to walk its way up and impact the road. So it has a, a definite positive impact um, on the roadway itself and getting uh, the parking off the roadway uh, obviously keeps it open for emergencies. So it, those are the, the primary things that, that we've looked at in this application. And I, I won't read this, but if, if you all wanna read it and have any questions, um, I think, I've addressed most of these. Um, the, the one thing I didn't mention is they are going to be improving the drainage conditions, um, which is obviously a good thing in this area as well. So certainly um, open to questions. 
Thank you, John. Um, commissioners, if you have questions for staff, let's start with uh, Al. And if you have questions for Laura or John, just throw them out there. Okay. Um, uh, no questions for John, although I, I thought that the presentation was excellent and very, very informative. So thanks a lot. Um, one question for Laura. Um, in the plans that I looked at, it seemed like there's at least one place and maybe more than one where we're being asked to approve um, development that goes beyond the property boundaries. Is that right? Um, I believe that there's one little corner of the front deck that could go beyond the property boundary, but I think that that's the only area. Where Did you see something other than the corner of the front deck? I thought that the driveway actually looked like there was part of it that was going to go beyond the property boundary. Um, yeah, the driveway is allowed to do that with an encroachment permit. So with the town approval, it's allowed to go into, um, into the road. Or if it's a private, I'm sorry, this is a private road. So with the permission of the private road maintenance organization, they can do that. Okay, but uh, maybe I maybe I saw it wrong. I was thinking it went into the neighbor's property. You're saying it's just went into the road easement? Um, that's my understanding. We can certainly confirm. Okay, all right. That that was really the uh, the only concern or question that I had. And I think um, when we get to the applicant portion, uh, Kenny may have a comment about that. Um, Megan, do you have any questions for staff? Um, I do, and mine would be about lighting. I don't know, Laura, if it's easy for you to pull up that lighting plan one more time. That would be great. Yeah, just a second. Okay. Uh, there's the lighting plan. Does that show well? Um, I don't see it. <laughs> Coming. <laughs> so, one of those days, I guess, the technology. I might have to stop sharing here. I think I did that, John. Just okay. So. Okay. Okay, that should be better. Okay, so so um, when I'm looking at this, it doesn't show um, any lighting at the garage itself or in the carport. So since the carport is open, correct? Um, yes. I'd love to see what lighting is suggested in there and then will there be any lighting at the garage, um, up garage lift itself? Um, and then, um, Will there be any type of like a EV charging station or whatnot in the carport? And if so, you know, how, how that's um, visible maybe to um, the road. Uh, so those are just a couple questions that I have. Is there any lighting associated with the, the stairs down from the road, more of a landscape lighting plan? But maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself. Maybe we're not um, ready to see all that yet, but. I think those are very good questions. Um, I apologize. I'm not the planner that reviewed the plans. Um, I'm trying to step in for the project planner. And so we can ask the applicant team if they can respond to those things. And then of course, this is um, a recommendation up to the planning commission. So we could always have any of those final details come back to an ASCC member. So that's just some things um, for us to think about. Great. And, uh... See Kenny making notes, so I'm sure those answers will come in a moment. Um, I only had one question. That's all I have. Oh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, man. Um, and this is just really out of curiosity. I'm I'm struck as I sometimes am by um, the way the setbacks are applied to small and difficult sites, uh, essentially creating a uh, permitted building area that's unbuildable. 
I'm just curious when these setbacks were adopted for this neighborhood. Does this go back quite a ways or do you have any knowledge about that? I am not sure, but I believe that the setbacks do go back quite a ways. Um, and I can tell you what my general interpretation of those has been is that the town must have known they were creating a lot of legal non-conforming situations, but they also knew that it was in an area where geologic safety is going to be a really important consideration. So I would imagine that the planners at the time knew that there was going to be limited development on most of these properties, that there wasn't going to be an option to increase the living area a lot. And so even though they were creating non-conforming properties, um, I think that they knew something like this would have to be coupled together with a variance mm -hmm. to be able to process it. So that that's my best guess as just as a professional thinking what they might have been thinking at the time. This is one of the most restrictive places in town when you couple the geologic conditions along with the setback requirements. So I think their point was just each site has to be really carefully considered on a case by case basis. All right, well, thank you for that. Um, any other questions from commissioners or staff? No, then um, Kenny, it's your turn to uh, add anything to the presentation that you'd like to and maybe answer some of the questions that came up. Um, through the chair, um, our, the advice of our town attorney, mm -hmm. um, since Kenny is a commissioner on the commission, is that another member of his team um, should provide the presentation. And so uh, we have Laura Ralston here who was gonna speak on behalf of the project. Hello, Laura. Hi, um, sorry, I have children in the background. Um, I've got some notes on this um, so I can present. And then I think that, um, you know, Kenny's well positioned to take additional questions as well. Um, so our proposal is to add much needed parking to our property on our little single lane road. The lower level additions are within the footprints above and serve both to strengthen the structures and provide enclosure as recommended for wildfire safety. Our exterior materials are all fire safe and we have adjusted the color scheme of the house to meet current design guidelines. We are proposing no landscaping or irrigation and only fire department required exterior lighting. We love our neighbors, our neighborhood and the town. In the past four years since we moved here, we have enjoyed the work of clearing ladder fuels and invasive species as well as bay trees, serving as stewards to do this in our challenging landscape. We're excited to make these changes to our home that will further improve safety for our whole community. And then to respond to some of the questions that came through, the, the driveway encroachment noted in the NV5 markup is an error in that drawing and is not being proposed per sheet A1 of the plan set. Um, and then just to reiterate, we are only proposing fire department required exterior lighting we like the moonlight and we're not proposing um, an EV charger. Um, and if we did in the future, we'd put it inside the garage portion. Great, thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, do you have questions for Laura? Al? No questions for me, thanks. Right. No, so it sounds like there's no lighting in the carport at the garage or the access from the road. Yep, that's what it sounds like. And um, I guess uh, my only question is uh, if you could clarify a little bit, um, Laura mentioned in her presentation that you'd like to preserve some flexibility for choice of exterior materials. Um, and I saw on the uh, material sample board that there is both um, looks like asphalt shingle roofing and metal roofing. Shown. Yeah, I, I think Kenny can speak to that as well. When we were looking at it last um, in the last six months and putting those materials together, um, I think that was mostly due to like availability in the market and not being sure what would be available. But um, if it's appropriate, Kenny will, he did more of the digging into that if he's allowed to respond. 
I was curious if uh, the flexibility is also requested for citing materials or if it's really focused on the group. And it, is it okay if Penny answers that question or do we need to go through Laura? Or um, through the chair. I just checked with the town attorney and Kenny can answer technical questions. Very good. So that um, microphone should be working or just turn it on. We checked the battery early. Um, is this working? Uh, I see I if there's an on button on top. There is a green light. I can hear you. Okay, yeah. great. Great. Um, so um, to, to just walk back one question regarding the exterior lighting. We do believe that the fire department will require us to put a light above the garage door facing the street. And that's what the, the light that's not a box was meant to be for. Um, the Sodor outdoor dark sky wall light. Um, and then um, for the exterior materials, our preference is, is the, the metal roofing and to use the metal roofing material for the for the dark gray siding as well. Um, but if those options aren't feasible, um, either because of availability or cost, um, we have this option of a fiber cement panel for the siding that's the same color, and this option of a concrete roof tile um, for, the, for the roofing. So it's, it's both for um, the lower level and their siding and the roofing that we, we have these options other than the, the metal, but we would prefer the metal if we can get it. All right, thank you. Uh, that was my only question. Al, Megan, any last thoughts, questions? None for me. Great. Well, no questions for me either. Thanks for the presentations. Uh, before we get to our discussion, I'll open the public comment. Uh, portion of this item and invite anybody from the public who wishes to make a comment about this application to raise your hand so Laura can recognize. There is only one member of the public that's present in addition to our council liaison. And I do not see any hands up. All right. I'll close the public comment section unless the council liaison wants to speak. Probably not. Uh, he does not have his hand up. All right, uh, public comments are closed. I'll come back to commissioners for discussion. And Al, why don't you kick us off? Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, so, you know, my starting point on something like this was uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, variances at all, because um, I always am so worried about the potential precedent set with uh, any sort of variance. Um, but going through this project and then also visiting the site this afternoon, um, I, I just can't see that uh, this would be replicated in other sites. Um, so I'm not near as concerned about a variant in this case as I typically would be. Um, you know, to me, the proposal is, is modest, but well thought out. Um, the materials look good to me. The uh, the planned improvements all make sense. Um, and it, you know, one of the things that really struck me is that by approving deviations to our standard rules, the uh, the site and the local community will actually be better off. So that's a pretty strong argument in my mind to. Uh, to approve or recommend approval to the planning commission to go forward with this project. I mean, the idea of uh, the road safety is going to be better, the road structure is going to be better, there's going to be better fire safety, better seismic safety, better drainage. You know, those things all are pretty compelling. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I think we should recommend approval, recommend that the planning commission approve these variances. And, uh, you know, from an ASCC point of view, I think that the proposal looks good and there's no particular changes that I would request. I, I think it's a well thought out proposal. Thank you, Bob. Megan, your thoughts. 
Yeah, I agree with Al, absolutely. I mean, the improvement to the, um, the peer support that will help uh, keep the, the road intact um, and the improvement of the drainage and the off-street parking options, which is desperately needed in these narrow um, access roads, um, I, I think is great. The support of all of the neighbors is really important in this case as well, considering that. Um, I would I, I would like to see um, an approval from a, a member of the ASCC of final materials and landscape lighting um, or exterior lighting. Um, but I, I can't see why we wouldn't recommend this approval. I think this is a smart, well thought out project and clearly the footprint um, <laughs> was never going to be a safe and smart option. So uh, I can see how this would be beneficial for not just the homeowner, but also um, the Wayside community. Great, thank you, Megan. Well, I don't have anything to add to what my colleagues have said. Uh, it's a, uh, from my point of view, it's both a sort of minimalist application to achieve the functional goals, um, and at the same time, a, a kind of a public improvement. Uh, the uphill neighbors, I'm sure, will appreciate some additional reinforcement of the road, um, since that's the only evacuation route from that neighborhood. Um, so. I'm in favor of approving this. I don't have any trouble making the findings. And um, Megan, I think it's uh, a fine idea to have, uh, say, a single ASCC member just sort of check off on the final material selection. Uh, I think that's uh, a good idea. So uh, if someone making a motion would like to add that as a condition, I would support that. Um, so unless either of you has something to add, I think we're ready for a motion. And who would like to volunteer for that? <laughs> uh, about if I make a motion that we recommend approval uh, of the variances and deviations to the planning commission um, and then add one condition to the, the conditions that an ASCC member do a final uh, review on the exterior materials and the lighting, final lighting. I will second that. Good. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Oh, aye. actually, I take that back. Oh. We have a new procedure because of the... Oh. The hybrid nature, I think each person needs to check in with their vote. With yeah, their vote. we're going to do roll call votes while some people are in the schoolhouse and others are on Zoom to make sure we've got it reflected into the record. So we'll call it out like we do for Council or Planning Commission. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Sill. Uh, aye. Vice Chair Cope. Aye. Chair Ross. Aye. As they say on the TV show, you have three ayes. So the motion passes three to zero. Thank you, Lori. All right. Uh, I think that concludes this item. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, good luck at the at the next steps. Um, thank you. You get to move on finally. I, I do think one one thing that will be interesting on this project is the. Um, uh, staging right there's not a lot of room on that lot and it's not a very big road so uh good luck and uh uh you know i'm i'm it's going to take some creativity yeah all right now that that item is concluded um commissioner chung if you'd like to rejoin the commission that'd be great and i think we don't have very much more business to do no, we don't. Um, thank you, John, for joining us this evening. Yes, thanks very much. Sure. So it was really informative. All right, let's pull my agenda up here. Um, we are now on to item two, which is commission reports. Uh, good commissioner. Uh, commission members have 
activity over the last since the last meeting to report. Al, any any work? I, I do not. Um, I did go and look at a property that was proposing a an ADU on Willowbrook, but that might have been a while ago because I missed the last meeting. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. Who, who was I with there? Uh, was yeah, Megan, I actually reported on that right. at the last yeah. meeting. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Great. And I do not have any activity since the last meeting to report. I'll invite any public comments that might be out there on this agenda item before I close it. Raise your hand if you'd like to make a comment. There's only one attendee, and that is our council liaison, and he does not have his hand. All right. I'll close item two, move on to item three, staff report. And looks like we have an update on the design guidelines, which will take place in 2023. Yeah, I wanted to give you some additional information on our latest thinking. Um, on the update to the design guidelines. So you might recall that the wildfire preparedness committee had suggested updates to the design guidelines. Um, and then more recently, I've had some conversations with some other committee members um, that are interested as well. So we had a conversation that included um, Al, um, commissioner from ASCC, and a representative from the sustainability committee and they're very interested in doing um, stronger work around water resources in the drought. And we realized in that conversation that, that there is an opportunity to really enhance our town's design guidelines around that area. We kind of were brainstorming about how we might wanna make changes to the code related to Willow and water preservation, and that also there could be design guidelines that could be updated. And then I had a really um, also a very nice conversation with the chair of the conservation committee, um, Catherine McGill and Judy Murphy. And in that conversation, there were some similar themes that came up. The conservation committee is interested in doing work related to native planting, water usage, um, fire resilience. So a lot of overlap between those interests. And so we thought, um, kind of brainstorming with those two groups, we thought it might be a really great opportunity to do some work across the different committees and so that they could work together maybe with wildfire preparedness, conservation, and sustainability to come up with some policies and proposals that would then come through ASCC Planning Commission and up to Council. So I wanted to give you that update, let you know um, that there was this idea that was going around. I haven't talked to wildfire preparedness yet, but um, wanted to get any feedback from this commission about your thoughts about that, how we might structure it. If ASCC would want to have a really active role with those um, three committees or whether you think that maybe those three committees could do some initial work and then have that come through ASCC. So just looking for any thoughts about how we might structure that. Um, the tentative timing for this is the committees would do um, kind of their initial work, background information, brainstorming of ideas in the first quarter of 2023, and then maybe start to meet across committees in the second quarter, and then going into a process um, through ASCC Planning Commission and Council in the second half of 2023 with the goal of having new design guidelines approved by the end of the year. So that's kind of what we thought about so far. I just wanted to get your impressions and ideas, and I don't know if Al wanted to speak to the meeting that we had together or add anything to that. Um, no, I think that that captured things well. Uh, I, I think it's a good idea. I think we're ready for some improvements in those areas. Um, so I, I would like to see those, those three committees work together and put together a, a, a joint proposal that would then come to us. I'm not sure I think that, I don't think the ASCC needs to be particularly heavily involved. Um, I, sustainability is using me kind of as a, a little consultant to help out a little bit. So I would be involved a little, but not, uh, hopefully not too much. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, I think it's a, a good idea. I'm, I'm very much in favor of it. Yeah, agreed. This is this is great. 
let them work through this and bring us some good stuff. Penny, thoughts? I, I agree. I think um, the, I guess that it's a reasonable expectation that things like design guidelines are periodically reviewed. Yeah. Um, and this seems as good a reason. Um, yeah, I, I think it is time for some updates and fine tuning to the design guidelines. Um, I'm, I'm sort of of two minds of whether the ASCC should be very involved or not. On the one hand, as the sort of quasi judicial body that makes recommendations and uh, decisions about projects, it seems like there might be a bit of awkwardness about also drafting those guidelines. So just a sort of mild concern about that. On the other hand, um, as commission members, we're certainly the ones who are exposed to what we see as conflicts between the existing design guidelines and the, uh, the sort of current day needs of the community and, uh, and project applications that come in, in sometimes in forms that maybe the design guidelines didn't originally anticipate. Um, for one thing, my, my sense is that projects are tending to uh, get larger than maybe they did 20 or 30 years ago when the design guidelines were drafted. And uh, so there are things like that that uh, I think an ASCC involvement could uh, help inform and um, you know, provide some input for those guidelines. But I, I think it's a very good idea to undertake that. Um, I'm curious if that would be something that uh, somebody needs to work up a budget allocation to present to council that that process usually happens in the first couple months of the calendar year. Um, so if it's something that um, uh, takes on serious form, I, it would be a great idea to have uh, uh, maybe at, in a meeting before the end of the year, some idea of what kind of resources would need to be committed to. I guess there's a, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I guess there's a question of, I mean, the in, in terms of the, the water usage in particular, um, you know, since we're sort of opening up the design guidelines as, as something that's being reviewed and revised and updated, um, I wonder if there's an extent to which there's a question that um, whether we should go through the entire document look for conflicts with policy or, um, I mean, we have a pretty strong stake as the ASCC in um, being able to implement the design, these design guidelines. Um, yes. And insofar as it may conflict with individual policies, um, that sort of undermines our ability to mm -hmm. yeah, make decisions efficiently. Uh, I think you raise a really good question, which is, you know, what the scope of this uh, should be. Is it from adding a little bit and fine tuning a couple things, or is it looking at, you know, the whole body of the design guidelines? I'd kind of leave that up to staff a little bit. I think it might be kind of ambitious to take on a complete rewrite. Um, but certainly we know a little bit more about fire hazards, about water use, um, and about, uh, and maybe ideas of how those can be addressed. Uh, one example might be uh, to take a little harder look at or add more rigor to the design guidelines in terms of landscape and the extent of landscaping. Um, we, I think we've seen more projects that sort of push the limits of water use and amount of landscaping. And we sometimes question, you know, is that really appropriate? in this era of increasing drought. So that might be, you know, something to look at as it's sort of related to water use is what the landscape guidelines might be. But yeah, that, that is, I mean, the way you regulate that, Dave, is by the water allowance, uh -huh. right? 
if you if you lower the water allowance, then that forces you to limit your landscaping. And that that is what the sustainability committee or that's one of the things that the sustainability committee is talking about. I mean, they are very much at the preliminary stage. I don't think they know what their what path they'll go down yet, but but that is one of the things they've talked about is is trying to limit landscaping on large lots. Uh -huh. So um, a couple of things as I'm listening um, to everyone talk, I'm thinking about um, maybe having some kind of kickoff meeting for this project that would include the ASCC. And so maybe they could send representatives of the committees um, to meet kind of like a study session format with ASCC and get some feedback on the types of things that you see as commissioners that you think would be interesting to update give them some of the benefit of your experience and then let them go work on it for a while. Um, so they've heard from you at the beginning, then they can work together across the three committees and then they could come back um, through the ASCC through the approval process. So that's kind of an idea that might be good to get kind of get the ball rolling. Um, Great idea. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you'll so. all be busy looking at projects, right? Yeah. So we have to be careful um, as volunteers how many um, tasks we give you. And then I think in terms of the scope of the update, um, staff would you know, want to check in with council and think about you know, how detailed do we wanna go? We don't wanna embark upon things that are really significant policy changes, I don't think at this time. It's more about enhancing what we have and bringing a little bit more, I dare to say, kind of science in the areas of fire safety um, water usage, you know, bring some of the latest information into it to strengthen and enhance what we have. So that's kind of what I'm imagining. Um, as everyone's aware, the town is working with a lot of different policy questions right now that have um, been challenging. And so this is an opportunity for people to work together on a project that should have really good results and hopefully nothing that's too, too controversial. Right, and it makes sense to me that we've got some committees that really are driving for some changes. And so that's great. I, I don't know that it's appropriate for us to go after changes when there's nobody pushing for them. Because um, then, you know, I, I think right now we have people pushing for changes. I don't think we should get into the mode of pulling, trying to pull changes in. Um, it just seems like uh, then it's going to be much more difficult if we have to sort of drive other groups to recommend changes. But we do have, I think, three groups that really have learned a lot over the last few years and, and have changes that they'd like to see. And I, and I think that those would certainly be good targets. Good thoughts. Okay, this is helpful discussion. Um, thank you very much. So all um, make an effort to meet with the chair of the wildfire preparedness committee and just kind of do a general check-in. And then we'll talk about taking an item to council to get their feedback so that um, as the chair mentioned, we can plan for it and put it into the program uh, for next calendar year. Great. So before I close this agenda item, I'll invite anybody from the public to comment if they wish. And there are no hands up. All right. Uh, so I'll close item three and just momentarily reopen item two because I realized that I've uh, forgotten that Kenny rejoined us as a commissioner. I didn't ask you if you had any uh, reports to make um, for commissioner activity since the last time we got together. Uh, just a minor one. We, um, we did a quick review of Nine Buck Meadow. Um, they had, they were approved with a condition. Um, and I remember it being not very controversial. It had to do with the exterior lighting. They had revised it um, down to 500 minutes. Um, and they had added the lighting controls that we had requested. And it was, um, it was we it. Great. Did that ring a bell, Nine Buck Meadow? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. 
So I'll reclose item two and move on to item four, our last item, which is uh, approval of the minutes. I think not everybody was present for September 12th, but I understand from staff at our last discussion that even if you weren't present for the meeting, it's permissible to vote on um, the approval so that we have a quorum for it. Uh, it are there any um, corrections or comments from commissioners about the minutes of September 12th, 2022? They look fine to me. I, I was not present, but so I. Right. Well, Jane was I believe them. <laughs> they look fine to me. All right. And I was present then and present now. So. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, so I, I should, in fact, approve them even so I do not abstain any longer. Is that. Um, it's your preference. So you are allowed to vote for them if you wish, but you are allowed to recuse if you would rather do that. It's up to you. So uh, if someone makes a motion and there is a- second. Okay, how about if I move to approve the minutes from uh, the last meeting uh, as written? A second. Any seconds? And Laura will take roll call for uh, the vote. Commissioner Chung? Um, Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, Commissioner Sill? Aye. Vice Chair Koch? I'm gonna abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. <laughs> Chair Ross? Aye. Thank you. That passes three nil nil. Uh, so, uh, those minutes are adopted. Um, and I neglected to ask if there are any public comments, but it doesn't sound like anybody is attending the meeting except the council leaders. Yeah, um, our planning commission liaison, Nicholas Turk, has since joined the meeting, but there's no other member for the public. All right, very good. I think that concludes our business for tonight. And I thank everybody for coming um, in person and via Zoom and for the great presentations from staff and extra information from the applicant. And I'll uh, adjourn the meeting. See you all next time. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone, good night. Good night. Good night.